First, in 1968, and I was an accepted freshman at Aquinas College. And I uh, was born and raised in Cleveland. So I had never lived in Michigan before. I had never lived out of the state of Ohio. But I received a four-year full-ride scholarship from Aquinas College. All tuition, all room and board paid for the four years. All my parents had to do was pay my book fees, you know, a book supplies for those four years. So um, I received this scholarship and Aquinas was the only out-of-state college that I applied to from Ohio. The other colleges were Case Western Reserve and Ohio State and a couple of others, but I, I uh, heard about Aquinas. I heard about the campus and it sounded like something I, I wanted to apply to. So I did and I got in, I got the scholarship and then I came here to begin my college career, August, 1968. And so I was here for four years at Aquinas. And then I got a job through Peter Wagey, his Center for Environmental Study. That was my first job. And I worked for him from 72 to 74. Then I got married to Tony Foster and he was at Wayne State Medical School in Detroit at the time. So that's when, we, when I moved to Detroit. And then I came back to Grand Rapids in 1987 when my husband got a job here. And I've been here ever since, and this is my home. I did major in English. I majored in political science, sociology, and econ. So far removed from the poetry world and the poetry mind, I wanted to be in broadcast journalism. So this was my journey from that to, to poetry. And so I, uh, someone told me, don't worry about going to broadcast school. Just learn about the problems of the day that you're going to be commenting on. So I learned about political science, sociology, economics, that kind of thing. And I got my first job, an intern job, in the news department at Channel 8 uh, with TV. And I was there my... Uh, junior year, January to May. It was a spring internship and I hated it. It was not what I thought it would be. I had to report on the, on the accidental drowning of a two-year-old boy. And I had to do it in a timely fashion because in broadcast journalism, they don't look at length, they look at time. And so I wrote up a little two minute segment and my supervisor there said, it's too long. So I cut it down to an hour and 30, I mean, excuse me, a minute and 30 seconds, too long. And then a minute, too long. And I finally cut it down to 40 seconds to talk about this little boy who died. And I thought, you know, I don't think this is for me. So I had always loved poetry. I always loved to read it, not necessarily write it. But I became more involved with poetry, uh, reading it more, writing it just for myself. And I didn't change my majors because remember I had that four year scholarship. And if I would have changed majors, I would have had to go for another year or two and maybe I wouldn't have you know, had the scholarship. So I just finished the major in political science, but I started getting more involved with poetry. And there was a scene in the East Town area, a poetry scene. There was a bookstore called the Village Bookstore on Wealthy. And I, I lived near there. I lived on Lake Drive. And um, I would walk there to the bookstore and I saw these posters, you know, poetry workshop, you know, uh, every other week, something like that. And I thought, I'm going to check it out. And it was just uh, a small group of people, maybe 10, 12 people talking about poetry, reading poetry, writing their own poetry, sharing the poetry. And it was at the Village Bookstore. And there was a man there, David Cope. And uh, I, I, I don't think he remembers me, but I remember him because I was like a, a nobody at that point. I was like in my early, early 20s and I, you know, had my rough drafts and I had my, my favorite poems with me, but I didn't consider myself in any shape, matter, or form a poet. I just wanted to learn. And um, I just remember him and his wife, Susie. And another man, Eric Grinke, was there with his wife, uh, Roseanne. And then there were a whole, you know, not a whole bunch, but like maybe eight, nine others. 
And there was a man there called Richard Jansma. He used to teach at Central and Michigan State, and he was uh, older, but he really liked what I was trying to do in my work. And just these little, you know, fragments, these little rough drafts, and he really encouraged me. So his name, Richard Jansma, and he told me what you have to do is read a lot and write a lot. So he introduced me to Nikki Giovanni, Diane Wachowski, um, you know, so many others, uh, uh, you know, Carolyn Forche. I mean, it was just wonderful how he opened my mind to the possibility of not only uh, American poetry, but other poetry from other parts of the world and styles, you know, uh, different eras, uh, the formalists, the beat poets, you know, uh, Ginsburg, Whitman, Dickinson, everything together. And I began to read and write. And then when I got married uh, a year later, because that was in 73, when I did the village bookstore poetry events, uh, the next year, 74, I was getting married and leaving for Detroit. And Richard Jansma told me, if you go to Detroit, there is a teacher at Wayne State. Her name is Faye Kiknasway. I heard her read at Ferris State University. She's a phenomenal poet. See if you could meet her or take her class. So this was this was in December, early December of 73. I called her at her office. Now this is before cell phones and email and and you know answer machines and she picked up. And I said, "You don't know me and I don't know you, but a man by the name of Richard Jansma asked me or told me told me, you know, demanded, if you are in Detroit, you must look her up and take her class. And we we lived in the city on Irvington, you know, not far from the state fairground. So uh, we lived, you know, in the city. And I said, I'm working. I have an eight to five job. But uh, these classes were Tuesdays and Thursdays, six to 930 every Tuesday and Thursday. And I would finish my job. I worked for Jones and Laughlin Steel Company, not in the foundry, but in their sales office, doing teletype and answering the phone. And so I would take the bus down Woodward, all the way down to Wayne State. And I said, we had no money at the time. We had no money. I said, I cannot pay for these classes. I can't even pay to audit, like for credit. And she says, well, then, why do you want to take these classes? And I just said, because I want to learn all I can about poetry. I don't care about grades or credit. And she was really impressed with that. And she said, you're on. I won't tell the registrar if you won't tell the registrar. So I was taking these free classes from Faye Kignasway, and we're still dear, dear friends. She now lives in Honolulu. We're still very, very dear friends. And she started me on that journey. Actually, it was Dick Jansma that started me, but it was Faye who taught me how to write sestinas and villanelles and sonnets. She took my interest in writing to another level. And then that was two years, you know, clandestine classes, you know, coming down, you know, to take her classes. And then um, she said, you know, you need to pursue this. You need to get an MFA in creative writing. And the first low residency MFA started in 1976 or 1975, maybe it was 76. And it's in Plainfield, Vermont at a uh, Goddard College in Vermont, Plainfield. And she said, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. Check it out. And by low residency, I mean, you were only there uh, twice a year for two weeks at a time. And then you lived your life wherever you lived. And it really demanded discipline and focus because you didn't go to class two or three times a week. You maybe uh, every three weeks, you mailed in your packet to your teacher mentor, but you had to be on task and on target. So I applied in 76, I went to visit the, the program and it was founded by Ellen Bryant Voigt, who's a phenomenal poet. She, I think she won the Pulitzer Prize and she had amassed 
this faculty, and I brought my graduation picture, faculty and students, Louise Gluck, who won the Nobel Prize a year ago, she was one of my teachers, Donald Hall, Bob Haas, dear Liesl Mueller, Faye Kignasway was also on that staff, uh, Raymond Carver, before he started writing his fabulous short stories, he was writing poetry, um, Michael Ryan, uh, I mean, it was a cavalcade of stars before they became famous, Heather McHugh, and she's in my graduation picture. So that really got me on the serious road of being a poet. And uh, I studied under Liesl Mueller and Stephen Dobbins, and now these low residency programs are all over the country. But that was the very first. And I was there from 77 to 79, and then um, uh, a couple of years after I graduated, that program moved from Goddard College in Vermont to Warren Wilson College in Asheville, North Carolina. So when people talk about the Warren Wilson program, that's basically my alma mater. Um, but that was the very beginning when I just was, I, I love to read poetry, but I never thought I'd be, you know, a, uh, a, serious poet, so to speak. But that is how it began, that, that journey. In 79, and we were still in Detroit, and, uh, and then when my husband was finished with his medical school and residency in Detroit, he got his first job. We wanted to come back to Grand Rapids, but there were no openings for his practice. So we went to Big Rapids and we were there for five years. I taught at Ferris for a couple of years. We were there for five years and that was from 82 to 87. And then I came back to Grand Rapids. We all came back. Uh, we had a son and a daughter at that time. So uh, that was in the summer of 87 that we came back. Yeah, I started poetry. This was such a great program, Creative Writers in the Schools. I worked for them from 1980 to 2002 when the governor at the time, John Engler, pulled the plug on the program. It was a fabulous program. So for 22 years, I worked in the program. Um, they, would, they, they were sponsored by the Michigan Council for the Arts, Michigan Council for uh, the Arts and Cultural Affairs, ArtServe Michigan. So there were different organizations involved with creative writers in the schools, but they would place uh, professional writers, be it poets, uh, playwrights, uh, short story writers, novelists, memoirists, in schools throughout the state. And it was public schools, private schools, parochial schools. All the schools had to do was write a grant, and if they got accepted, uh, the state uh, arts council paid all of my expenses, and these residencies would last any anywhere from three a few days to a few months. So I did that for 22 years. I averaged maybe uh, oh three to five schools an academic year, and it was K through 12. So sometimes I had the big kids, and sometimes I had the little kids, but those workshops were great. And so uh, a little fast forward, when I became Poet Laureate, that was my focus to bring poetry into the classroom. And uh, even though I'm a product of the academy, you know, I have my college degree, I have my MFA, my main love is the community workshop, whether it be in the schools or at senior citizen centers, you know, whatever. But it was at Creative Writers in the Schools for those 22 years that really forged my love of teaching in the community. New people, as always, you know, because I, we're talking from uh, 73, 74 to 87. So a, a lot of things, you know, happened, you know, during that time. I got to know Miriam Peterson very well, Rod Torson, David Cope, you know, so uh, who now remembers me, but I don't think he remembered me from, you know, 73, 74. But um, it was, a, a, it was, we had wonderful workshops. And then I became involved with the UICA at, uh, you know, the Ray Street Gallery. And um, I was the director of their literature programming from 89 
to 97. And then I was also on the board of the UICA from that time, from 89 to I think 96. So I became very involved with, again, community workshops at the UICA when first it was at Ray Street, then it moved to where the new art museum is, and then it moved to Sheldon, and then it was on division and now it's you know, uh, uh, run by Kendall, you know, in, in their school. But so I, I followed the UICA in its various uh, venues and locations, but um, I also saw a, a, growing community, uh, a growing community of poets from there. At that time, I'm trying to think, I had my first chapbook ever come out when I came back to Grand Rapids. This is a highlight, folks. So here I am, I've been writing all this time, have my MFA and sending out my uh, collections, full length collections or chapel collections. And it was um, coming back to uh, Grand Rapids in 1987, my first chapbook, History of the Body. And um, uh, all of those prose poems are included in Living of the Fireness at the very back of, of that book. But uh, that first chapbook came out from Coffee House Press in Minneapolis. Uh, it came out literally like the month after I moved back to Grand Rapids. So I think that's pretty a pretty good sign that I was where I wanted to be and where I needed to be. When I came back in 87, again, I became involved with uh, the UICA, but I also became involved in a wonderful poetry workshop that included Miriam Peterson, I mentioned her before, uh, Rodney Torreson, uh, Mary Vandemulen. Uh, there was also uh, Jack Riddle, even though he did live in Grand Rapids, he was in uh, he taught at Hope College, and he would come in for our workshops. And I think we had these workshops once a month at different people's homes. And I, again, extended my craft in, in those ways. And keep in mind, I was very active in the poetry scene in Detroit when I lived there from 74 to... 82, 83, I was very involved with the poetry scene there with Faye Kiknaswe, Wayne State University. That's when I was, you know, uh, taking the, the uh, low residency MFA program from Goddard College. I was living in Detroit at the time. So there was a scene there in Detroit too. And as a matter of fact, my dear friend, Therese Becker of the lovely, who gave me the lovely red scarf, she, I met her in a Detroit workshop for poetry. So I, I kept up with my craft even when I was there. So coming back to Grand Rapids, again, it was like coming home and uh, meeting these poets for the first time. Or uh, sometimes these are people that I had known about or just read their work in various magazines or journals. And then being able to workshop with them and read with them. I've read with Rod and Miriam and David Cope uh, many times, you know, in the, in the community. So it was a uh, uh, just very vibrant. This was, you know, the 80s, 90s into the early 2000s when we had our, our workshops. After my years at UICA, and this was an interesting story, I had this idea to bring a top-notch writing series to Aquinas. My alma mater made sense. So um, I was at the funeral of another fine poet, a Detroit poet, Larry Pike, and i he was a dear friend. I went to his memorial. This was... Um, he died in March of 95. This was April of 95 when I went to his memorial at Macomb Community College where he taught. And on the way back, I was with my husband, Tony, and I was talking about poetry ideas. And I said, you know, Larry had this wonderful series at Macomb Community College. And I said, what I like to do is start something like that at Aquinas, the Contemporary Writer Series. Let's see what the college would say. And I had a vision. It would be four readers every academic year, two in the fall, two in the spring. It would always be free, open to the public. And I had a dream team of people I wanted to ask and you know to, you know, to come and read. So we approached Aquinas 
They were very supportive, very excited, very open to the idea. And my husband and I founded the series, not only founding the endowment, so now it is in perpetuity forever. They don't have to worry about budget. So we founded the endowment and we also, uh, every year for about 15 years, we gave money for the operating expenses until that endowment could pay for itself. So uh, our first year, we had Marilyn Nelson, wonderful African-American poet. Uh, I think she taught at UConn, University of Connecticut. We had the amazing Lee Young Lee. What a fabulous you know, Chinese-American poet who I think now lives in Chicago. We had Stephen Dunn, the great late Stephen Dunn, uh, who won the Pulitzer Prize. And then we ended that first season with Naomi Shihab Nye, Palestinian-American poet. So it was a... It was a journey and, you know, uh, it was just, I am so pleased that that, that that happened, that that happened for not only Aquinas, but the greater Grand Rapids and West Michigan community. Because people always ask, how many children do you have? And I say, well, I have a son who was born in Detroit. I have a daughter who was born in Big Rapids and I have the Contemporary Writer Series because that's now my baby. And now it's like of age, it's over 21. So it's, well, actually, it, it they are now celebrating their 25th anniversary. So um, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question because uh, that's very dear to my heart. Very dear to my heart. They, and they wanted to call it the Linda Nemec Foster Writing Series. I said, no, 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 no. Contemporary Writer Series at Aquinas College. You don't have to put our names on it. And um, I know we had uh, Ed Hirsch, the great poet Ed Hirsch, who is now president of the Guggenheim Foundation in New York City. He read for us, I think it was in 2015. And I told him that they wanted to name the series after me. And I said, you know, I wouldn't have it. And Ed said, oh, Linda, you're uh, uh, you're more of a saint than I am. I, I would have taken that. I would have had them you know, name it after me. But at any rate, it's uh, it's going well. And um, we're just very pleased with how that that all happened there at Aquinas. I don't know if I could show you this little picture. Okay, here's a picture, I don't know if you could see this, of little Linda in Cleveland. Can you see where I am? I'm right in the middle there. There is little Linda. This was taken in 1954 in Cleveland. This is Slavic village an area where a lot of Slavic immigrants lived. Ukrainian, Russian, Polish, Bohemian, Hungarian. There we were. It was a very, if you look at it closely, it was a very poor neighborhood. This is my backyard. You see the broken fence. You see the factory stacks. You see the dead trees. And these two little boys with me, they were immigrants from Hungary. They were the Hurdy boys. I can't remember their first names, but there they are. And so I went... From there to, this is when I was um, uh, the inaugural Poet Laureate. Um, I was with Jennifer Granholm, the governor at the time. Uh, I was uh, a finalist for the um, uh, governor's awards for art and culture in literature. So I was one of three finalists. This was in Detroit at the Detroit Institute of Arts. So this was in 07. So it was a couple of years after I was you know, done with my tenure as Poet Laureate, but I was introduced as the inaugural Poet Laureate of Grand Rapids. So to go from this little girl to that big girl uh, was, was quite a journey. And it was poetry. It was poetry that opened the door for me. And I can't be dramatic and say poetry changed my life or saved my life. No, poetry, poetry let me discover my life and discover my voice, and discover myself. So when I was asked to be first poet laureate of this city that has become my home, this city that when I moved back to it, I had my first book published, you know, my first collection, you know, here when I um, came back to Grand Rapids, it was an honor. It was such a treat. And the first thing I did as poet laureate, I had to, I was commissioned to write some poems 
for the public sphere. So when they reopened the Grand Rapids Public Library downtown, they had this big renovation project. I think the library was closed for like two or three years and it was this wonderful renovation. And when they had the opening, the grand opening in April of 2003, that's when I was introduced as the Poet Laureate. And there was this wonderful fanfare. Um, Mayor John Logie was there and Vern Ehlers and all the city fathers and mothers. And they had it, um, there's these wonderful balconies in the back of the um, uh, art museum, uh, not the art museum, the, the public library. And that's where they had this little program. And I had to write a poem about libraries and I wrote a sonnet um, and it was about, it was called Beginnings. And it was about my father's love of libraries back in Cleveland. So I wrote about him in this poem and I wrote about my first librarian I ever met when I was a little girl, Miss Charlotte. And it was my, um, the way to honor the librarians and libraries in my life that got me to love reading. So, and then my, my second, uh, uh, poem that I had a, that was commissioned when I was poet laureate was when Mayor George Harwell was inaugurated in December of 03. And, um, that, uh, that poem was called uh, The Movement of Grace, and it was an acrostic poem based on the letters of his name. So I took George Hartwell, wrote it down on the paper, and each line began with G or E or O. And uh, he was so pleased with that poem, he would tell people, well, uh, and this was before Barack Obama and Joe, Joe Biden, he would say, well, John F. Kennedy had Robert Frost, and Bill Clinton had Maya Angelou, but I have Linda Nemec Foster. So I was so honored when he said that to the public, but it was a, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity and uh, a wonderful privilege to be the first uh, poet laureate of Grand Rapids. And as I said before, my main focus was bringing poetry into the classrooms. So that's what I did for those two years. I did about like 35 or 40 events for, for children. And one thing that was going on, and I don't know if you're leading into this, but there was a shooting at Hall School, and this was an event. But um, as one friend said, nothing stops poetry. A friend of mine told me that, Cecilia Woolock, who is now in Jeshua, Poland on a Fulbright helping the Ukrainian refugees, she told me nothing stops poetry. Not war, not disaster, not hurricanes. And this, what happened, this incident at Hall School is a perfect metaphor for how nothing stops poetry. This was in April of 1996, and I wasn't poet laureate yet, but I was still doing creative writers in the school. And I had a residency to be at Hall School teaching fourth and fifth graders, I think it was a couple of weeks. And actually, I got a big grant to do this. Not only the school got a grant, but I got a big grant to write new work and teach in the community. So I'll never forget, Mr. O'Brien was the teacher there who was my liaison for this residency. And uh, he contacted the Grand Rapids Press and Terry Finch Hamilton um, did, a, she was going to shadow me the whole week and she was going to do a, a, you know, a, a big article on me for the Grand Rapids Press because they were all excited about this Hall School residency. And after the first day, she says, you know, not too much is happening. I mean, you're doing a lot of great things in the classroom, but you know, you're going room to room and talking about color poems and animal poems and name poems and acrostics. I mean, you know, I don't know how long my editor is going to, you know, have me on the job. Well, the next day there was that shooting. And it happened after school. It was in the parking lot. And it was someone who wasn't a student of the school had a grudge with someone on the bus, on the school bus, and came onto the parking lot, onto the grounds, and shot up the bus. Thankfully, no one was hit or even injured. But the boy was taken into custody. I think he was only 14 or 15. But you can't imagine what that did to the school and what that did to the children. And even though, and I was in the building when this happened, even though most of them had left for the day, 
it was still there. That vibe was still there. And so the next day when I came to school, uh, now it's Cesar Chavez Elementary School, but when I came to Hall Street School that next day, there was this police presence, there were these you know, cops, there were police cars, just to give the community and the children a sense of security that don't worry, don't worry, you know, uh, it won't happen again. And unfortunately in this country, those events keep on happening. But for this time, this was in April of 96, uh, I had my job to do. And my job was to let these children know that nothing, nothing could conquer them or destroy them, not even fear. And I said, let's write through this. Let's write about ourselves. And so Terry Finch Hamilton did this great um, article in the uh, Grand Rapids Press, and it um, ran for, you know, uh, some Sunday. It was uh, April 3rd at the end of the residency. And I don't know if you could see it, but here is one of my students, and she is reading her or showing the camera her poem called I Am. It is a poem about her identity, who she, um, uh, where she belongs. And she was an African-American uh, student who had relatives in Kenya. So she talked about that. And these uh, poetry uh, workshops was some way for these children to really find their voice. And I would say, number one, and I still say this in all my poetry classes, there is no wrong way to write a poem. There is no right way to write a poem. Don't let anyone tell you, even a college prof, even a college professor, don't let anyone tell you there is a certain way to write. There isn't. It's a fallacy. There is no right way. There is no wrong way. But there is your way. And my job here is to show you how to discover what that way is and to open the door, to, you know, take those boundaries away. And I said, what happened yesterday in the parking lot, it's not, you know, don't worry about that. And if you want to write about it, please do. But the main focus here is you and your voices and uh, what you want to say about your lives. And um, that really galvanized the, the students. And I, it was like, a, you know, these residencies, it would be like 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m with 30 minutes for lunch. So, and that was like from 1980 to 2002 when I did these residencies. Now what happened at Hall School, dear Mr. O'Brien wanted to do something special after my residency. So in May, he said, how about after Mother's Day, mid-May, uh, uh, mid we have a big event, not, you know, uh, at our school, but like at a museum or a library. So we got the UICA when it was still on Monroe before it moved when, where the new art museum is now. So we rented it out and this was a big deal. We had flyers in uh, English and Spanish sent to all the kids that <clears throat> I taught and said, you know, come, it was like a, a I think it was a, a Thursday evening right after school, like from four to 5.30, we were gonna have this, this big event. And I remember there was this one little boy and he, he call, they called me Poetry Lady. Uh, and she, he said, Poetry Lady, he was like in fifth grade, Poetry Lady, Poetry Lady, you know, I don't even wanna take this flyer home because no one's gonna come for me. Well, my family isn't gonna come. My siblings aren't gonna come. You know, they're, they're not gonna come. I said, I think his name was Jose. I said, please take it. Just, you know, let, let your family know. So don't you know, that day, what Mr. O'Brien did, he rented a Grand Rapids Public Schools bus because some of these families didn't have transportation, didn't have cars, couldn't get there. And he was brilliant. He, he rented a school bus and it, they filled it. And it was this, this, they were all fifth graders and they were all duded up in their suits. The, the girls had their first communion gowns because they had just done First Communion, and it was really magnificent. We had gang members that were siblings of these children hold a truce during that, that day. 
So they would come to this little poetry gathering and I introduced each one and they read their color poem or their I am poem or their uh, you know poem about the shootings, the, the, the shooting, I should say. And Jose was there with his family. And I said, here you go. Look, wasn't this a great, great time? And he said, poetry lady, I'll remember this for the rest of my life. And that in my teaching career, you don't get better than that. You can't get better than that. Better than teaching, you know, graduate school or college age kids. That comment, I'll never forget this for the rest of my life. This was so neat. Okay, first of all, let's look at what happened in Grand Rapids and Michigan and then far field because I just wanted this uh this higher profile of poetry really to be out there as much as I could. So I did about 35 to 40 events, you know, in Grand Rapids itself. I also did an event in Detroit with Nikki Giovanni. That, that was really stunning, the, the power of the word, the power of not only poetry on the page, but spoken word. And then um, I was asked in June of 05, uh, to go with Mayor George Hartwell and Reverend uh, Robert Dean, who was a city commissioner at the time, and a number of other city officials to go to Bielska Biała, Poland, which is Grand Rapids' sister city in Poland. Grand Rapids also has sister cities in Italy and Ghana, in Africa, in Mexico, and Japan. But uh, Mayor Hartwell wanted to go to Poland so we got this, we had maybe like 14, 15 people, that was the contingent, and they asked me to be the cultural liaison as the inaugural poet laureate. So I think I read a, a, a poem. I think George Hartwell wanted me to read his poem that I wrote that I wrote for his inauguration. I said, sure, George, because he's been so supportive. He, he was as um, mayor, so supportive of the arts, specifically poetry and my poetry in particular. He was just fabulous. So I said, sure, you know, I'll go. That was June of 05. And um, I had, um, I do have a, a wonderful picture, um, if I could show it, of me with Reverend uh, Robert Dean. Uh, here is me and Reverend Robert Dean. At the time, he was a Grand Rapids City Commissioner. And we are at the um, historic City Hall in Bielsko Biala, Poland, beautiful City Hall. They had this huge reception for us. Look at all these people in the back, and they were like booted up. Um, and we were with other officials, Mayor uh, George Hartwell, as I said, Aquinas College President Harry Knopke was also uh, invited on this trip. And it was an official delegation to celebrate the sister city partnership between Grand Rapids and Bielsko Biała. So um, I was, um, uh, you know, doing my. Uh, uh, talking to high school students at the time about poetry, talking to college students there at the time too. And uh, it was a wonderful way to get Grand Rapids poetry on the map on the other side of the world. So that was cool. That was cool. And then um, fast forward to 2019, I was invited back to Bielska Biała for a month. I did a poetry residency at the University of Bielska Biała, uh, their English language seminar. So I didn't have to worry because, you know, I am Polish American. All four of my grandparents were born in Southern Poland, but I don't know my, that was my first language, but I don't know it well. I don't know it well to speak or to read it or to write it. So I was in the, their English language seminar. They all spoke, you know, English there, so I didn't have to worry about an interpreter or a translator. And I was there for a full month teaching American poetry and American literature, specifically, you know, the poetry of Grand Rapids, my poetry, the poetry of Li Young Li, the Chinese American poet from who now lives in Chicago, and Lisa Mueller, my dear, dear mentor from graduate school, who's an uh, immigrant from Ger from Germany. So I talked about the immigrant experience in America and how poetry reflected that, whether it be from the German-American side, Liesl Mueller, Chinese-American side, Lee Young Lee, or Polish-American with my work. And I found out that these students, and they were, some of them were undergraduate, some of them were graduate students, and they were actually translating 
my work into Polish as part of their master's thesis for their graduate program. And that was, that was an honor. That was something. And um, again, I've got just, um, this was me in Białka Poland, before my major reading at the library. And uh, they, and the one wonderful thing there, the mayor of Bielska gave me this beautiful apartment and Tony was with me because I said, I will not do it without my Mr. Everything. So Tony came, he was my driver, you know, I was like my a, a little assistant and we were there for a full month of October of 2019, right before the pandemic hit in early 2020. So we were there right before uh, COVID hit. And it was probably one of the most challenging teaching jobs of my career, but the most gratifying. Cause it was, it was really uh, challenging cause their pedagogy in Europe is different in teaching on the college level. But I just kind of uh, um, rolled with it. And then I changed their pedagogy a bit with how I teach in the classroom, but it, it all went very, very well. Wonderful faculty, wonderful students, gracious, uh, kind, generous. And uh, that was a, a, a remarkable time. And as I said, the mayor, mayor's office, uh, you know, really sponsored my trip and gave me this apartment for free and vouchers for wonderful restaurants in town. So it was uh, uh, one of the highlights of my teaching career. The first time I ever, and only time I ever submitted to Dyer Ives is before I got married. It was spring of 1974. Remember I was doing those little workshops at the Village Bookstore on Wealthy, where I met David Cope for the first time and Richard Jansma. Well, I um, wrote some poems and I, first and only time I submitted poems to Dyer Ives, and I was an honorable mention in 1974. And I didn't win one of the prizes, but you know, I had my uh, poem submitted and, and published here. And even the, the Grand Rapids Press, um, and I don't know if you can see this, but this is so old school, it's like yellow. The Grand Rapids Press back in like uh, it was May 12, 1974. Here was a little article about the winners of the Dyer Ives. I think it was their sixth anniversary of the contest. And so um, my name is, you know, at the bottom with when they talk about the other uh, people in the in the in the booklet. But um, I became involved with the Dyer Ives, you know, foundation at that time. And then also the Grand Rapids Public Library has opened up an archive on me and my work. So I've been donating um, my vast, Christine has seen some of these things, my, my vast uh, collection of um, old pictures and posters and rough drafts and correspondence like with Seamus Heaney, you know, uh, Irish poet who won the Nobel Prize. He came to read at Aquinas. Uh, for our Contemporary Writer Series. That was a highlight. So um, I became involved with um, uh, donating my papers and correspondence to the uh, Grand Rapids Public Library. So I wanted to keep, and also I wanted to keep alive those f records of the first Poet Laureate, the inaugural Grand Rapids Poet Laureate for their, for their special collections. I love collaboration and not that it's a smooth road all the time because when you have different personalities, things happen, but it really opens up your work because there's another dimension. Um, uh, I've worked with musicians. Let's talk about one, Laszlo Slomovitz. He was born in Budapest. He's a Hungarian Jew, but now lives in Ann Arbor. And I have a chapter called 10 Songs from Bulgaria. And uh, those were based on haunting black and white photographs taken by a Bulgarian photo a photographer of the marginalized people in Eastern Europe, the orphans, the widows, the marginalized, the homeless, people in veterans homes, people in asylums in uh, Eastern Europe. And there were 10 of them in a Harper's Magazine portfolio. His, the name of the photographer is Yako Vasilev. I was so moved 
by these photographs, I wrote a chapbook called 10 Songs from Bulgaria that Cervena Barva Press out of Boston published in, I think it was in um, 07, 08. And this musician, Laszlo Somovitz, living in Ann Arbor, a friend of his bought a copy of that chapbook for him. He's reading the poems. And even before he asks me my permission, he starts crafting original musical compositions based on each of these 10 poems. And after he finished four, he decided, I better contact Linda to see if it's okay with her publisher, you know, copyrights, you know, legality, you know, if this is okay. And I said, well, I, I'd never met him before. I said, well, you know, let's talk about this. So he said, I'll send you a little demo. And I was so moved. I'm thinking he got, and he didn't even see the original photographs. He was just reading the poems. I said, he guessed it. And he was using the lyrics, uh, the, using the lines of my poems as lyrics for the songs. So it was music and lyrics. And I said, you have my blessing, go for it. So he finished it in a little over a year. And we had the world premiere, I think it was in April of 2013 at Schuler Books. We had the premiere with me reading the poem and then having Laszlo with his guitar, uh, you know, sing, sing his melodies. And then he also produced a CD called Cry of Freedom where he had other musicians, uh, a violinist, um, an accordion, accordion player, uh, a pianist, his guitar. Uh, you know, it was just a, a wonderful collection. And he opened up my work with the dimension of his music. And that's why collaborating with visual artists, I just did a collaboration with Meredith Riddle at Lowell, the Lowell Arts uh, Center for a piece we did together, her painting and my poem on the pandemic. But um, she also did the illustrations for the Lake Michigan Mermaid. And so that is like the trifecta of collaboration right there, because you have me, you have Anne-Marie Oman, another writer, another poet, and Meredith Riddle doing, weaving this tale in poems, a story about a, a young girl and a mermaid who uh, comes into her life. So these collaborations have been nothing but miraculous for me as a poet and writer. And I, I hope that the other people I collaborate with, it's, it's good for them too. I know uh, Laz, Laszlo had a wonderful time. So um, it's important because that breaks the, the, the walls between the arts because there really are no walls. I believe there really are no walls, especially within our humanity too. Uh, so the uh, this cross pollinization between visual art and music, and I've been on the stage too with poetry uh, and dance. It's it's all good, and it just strengthens the bond between people, and it opens up the the poem to more possibilities. And it's, it's that connection, like uh, uh, nothing stops poetry. Even what's happening now in Ukraine, and I have family and friends who live there, well, in Poland, they live near the border. They're, they're not in the crossfires, but they're very close to that firestorm. It's horrific, but people are writing. They're writing. They're writing poems. They're writing essays. They're writing stories. Putin can't kill that. And that's why we have to remind ourselves in the midst of everything, in the midst of Columbine and, and what happened at Oxford High School, what happened at Hall School, you know, that shooting in the parking lot, good always wins. No, you might not think it, but good is always more powerful than evil and poetry is part of that good. My process is not very focused or disciplined. I'll go on camera. I can't lie. I'm only all, you know, <laughs> what you see is what you get. But I write in cycles. So I write in sequences. I write in cycles. If something moves me, I write it. I don't write every day. Some people do. My hat's off to them. Um, but I do not have that focus and discipline. But when I write, I write. 
when I write, I write. So I have th hundreds of rough drafts. I don't want to say thousands. That would be embellishing it exaggeration, but I have hundreds of rough drafts, you know, in, in my office, in the annex of my office, because I don't have enough room in my office for everything. And um, they are like little treasure troves. And every now and then I discover one and I'm thinking, this poem is almost done. Why did I just leave it in the draft pile? Let's take it out and let's do something with it. Um, I have a new uh, manuscript coming out next year called Bone Country, these prose poems. And there, there was 90 of them, but I had 150 rough drafts of these prose poems from our travels. And so I was able to draft and revise 90 of the 150. One of these days, I'm going to go back to the remaining 60 and see what's, what happens because those 90 will be published next year in a book. But I want to end the, this little session with a poem. And um, it is about my mother. And it's from the Blue Divide where I start talking about uh, family a lot. There's a lot of family poems in, in this book. Uh, I'm going to read a poem about my mom, and uh, she was into cleaning the house and gossip from Hollywood. That was her two big things. And so this tells you a little bit about her life. Uh, I talk about window wax, which is this, uh, it was before Windex, you would put it on windows and mirrors. It would dry white or pink, you'd wipe it off, and it was a brilliant window or mirror. I talk about Prussian bluing, uh, laundry additive. You would put it in the laundry, you know, the um, the washing machine. It made the water blue, but it made the white shirts more whiter. And so I also talk about her love of movie stars, Ava Gardner, Jean Harlow, Greta Garbo, Joan Crawford, they're all in this poem. And it begins with a great quote from Ava Gardner when a news reporter asked her, describe your business, describe Hollywood, describe show business. And she said, it's the kissiest business in the world. You have to keep kissing people, Ava Gardner. A kiss is just a kiss. My mother, in her own words, didn't know much but what she knew, she knew. How to darn a sock's hole until its universe imploded into a white dwarf of string theories. How to polish window wax into a mirror until it reflected a gaze more intense than Snow White's stepmother. How to magically stir the cauldron of laundry to transform Prussian bluing into a pure white shirt. And then, her encyclopedic knowledge of movie stars. She never called them actors or actresses, but stars. And in, as in the heavens, the constellations, the Big Bang. Her lessons were taught by chain-smoking gossip columnists. She pored over their theses, illuminated the pages of Confidential, The Lowdown, Hush Hush and Uncensored. My mother could tell you how Jean Harlow really died. It wasn't kidney failure, but she was poisoned by all that peroxide she used on her hair. How Greta Garbo brushed her teeth. She never used toothpaste, only salt. How Joan Crawford plucked her eyebrows. She didn't, enough said. My mother loved the backstabbing of it, the kiss and tell of it, the guilty pleasure of it. And when she read this quote from Ingrid Bergman, a kiss is a lovely trick designed by nature to stop speech when words become superfluous. My mother, with her blue hands, an absent husband, almost believed it. I want to talk about one of the great highlights of my life, and it happened here in Grand Rapids with the Contemporary Writer Series, and it happened in May of 2006 when the great Irish poet Seamus Heaney, Nobel laureate, Nobel Prize in Literature, came to Aquinas to read. And here's a picture of uh, Seamus in the middle. Um, my, I'm sitting on the right, and Tony Foster, my husband, is on the left. And this is uh, after his reading for the Contemporary Writer Series at Aquinas College, and it was an event. Um, 
he was on his American book tour and he was only going to go to seven cities in, in America. And so he was going to go to New York, New Jersey, Atlanta, Houston, Cincinnati, L.A., and there was one more on the trip. And two years before, his friend Michael Adanche, the novelist who wrote The English Patient, uh, Adanche came to read for our Contemporary Writers Series at Aquinas in the spring of 04 and loved it. He had a great time, and he told his agent at Barclay, he said, you know, I'd go there in a heartbeat. I'd go back to Aquinas in a heartbeat. It was such a good time. The students were great. The faculty was great. I was very welcoming and, and generous. And so his agent at Barclay was also Seamus Heaney's agent. And when Seamus was getting his little book tour together, they asked him, well, you know, where where else would you like to go? And he said, well, that that place that Michael Adanchi went to, that Aquinas College. And actually what we found out, his wife went to a college in Ireland called Aquinas. So he thought, it's ordained, it's ordained, I've got to go. So uh, that's what happened. He came, and keep in mind, this was mid-May of 06, after graduation. And most of our audience our students, and we're thinking, who's going to come? It's after graduation. Well, we had students coming back for this. We had, you know, members of the Grand Rapids community. We had people from Chicago, Ann Arbor, Detroit. We had 620 people in Wagey Ballroom, Wagey Center Ballroom. It, it's That's probably the max. I think that's the Guinness Book of World Record for attendance for Contemporary Writer Series. We had, like, 620 people from, we had to have an overflow room. And he was brilliant. And he read for uh, uh, an hour and had a Q&A for about 30 minutes. And he was so, just so wonderful. It was uh, magic. It was, it was all magic, magical time. And that was uh, probably one of the highlights of the Contemporary Writer Series. Another highlight was with Sarah Kay. She's a spoken word uh, performance poet, and I think she read in 2015, and we had 590 people. We had someone from Toronto come because they, they're you know big fans. She was like the youngest winner of the Deaf Poetry Jam back in the day, and uh, she now lives in, in the Boston area, Sarah Kay. But it was Seamus who was just, uh, what a star. What a star. And then, you know, he's, he's passed since. But uh, we were just very fortunate to have him uh, at Aquinas. And uh, that's where he wanted to come to read. Oh, I'll tell you, first poem, Dylan Thomas's Fernhill. Dylan Thomas, a poet from Wales, his poem, Fernhill, is such a beautiful poem about the loss of innocence and growing up and growing old. And you don't believe it when you're young. You don't believe, oh, I could live forever. And that doesn't happen. And the very, it's such a musical poem. And I love the music of poetry. And I love all creative writing, be it prose or short stories or novels. But with poetry, there is such a power of language and music. And a lot of that music stems from what's blank on the page. In a poem, you have a lot of blank space, which is just as important as the words, because that's the silence that the words are um, placed next to. And I don't want to say against, because that's, that's like a pejorative word. They work in harmony. In a poem, that blank space and the air and the words all work in harmony to get that poem off the page and into the air and into your readers, be it they, you know, reading the poem or if they're, they're listening to it. So there is a musicality in poetry. And that Dylan Thomas poem, Fern Hill, the very last three lines are, Oh, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. Just listen to that. And I, you know, read that poem, I thought, what a beautiful gift. I hope I would have that gift someday, you know, to form language that way. And as a matter of fact, I quote those lines in my most recent book, The Blue Divide. 
I quoted those lines. So uh, when I read Fern Hill in college, it was in high school, and I still wanted to be that broadcast journalist, remember? When I read that poem, and when I realized after that internship job at Wood TV when I was a junior in college that that wasn't for me, I went back to Fern Hill, and I went back to Dylan Thomas, and uh, that's what got me started on the road. History, art, family, and friends. Those are what I would say things that intrigue me, that I write about, that's kind of in my DNA. For instance, the uh, history of the part of the world where my family is from. Uh, Central Europe, Southern Poland, uh, near the Tatra Mountains, all four of my grandparents came from there. My uh, father's parents, my mother's parents. I've been there many times. I've been to Poland nine times. I've been to that Ukraine border too. It's a beautiful, beautiful landscape, but oh, the history that it's gone through, that it's going through right now. And that is in my DNA. Um, I remember I met the great poet, uh, Charles Simic, who was also born in that neck of the woods. He was born in Belgrade. And I remember when I met him for the first time, I met him at Hope College after he gave a reading. And I went to a party at Jack Riddle's house where uh, uh, Charles was. And I was just getting ready to leave. We were talking. And he wanted to know, where are you from? You know, I told him, Linda Demick, first, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm originally from Cleveland, but now I live in Grand Rapids. I live in Michigan. He said, no, 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 no. He said, where is your blood from? And I'll never forget that. And I said, it's from Central Europe. All my family is from Southern Poland. He says, that's it. That's it. That's where I see the connection. Because at first, he thought he had met me. He said, oh, I, I met you once in Belgrade. I said, I've never been to Belgrade. He says, no, 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 you were there at a coffee shop. I said, no, no, Mr. Simic, I've never been there. He says, your face looks so familiar. And then that's when he asked me about where is your blood from? Where is your history from? And when I told him, he says, that's it. That's it. You have a face that's so familiar to me. And I, I felt that was such a gift. So history is one thing. Art is another. As you know, I've collaborated with a lot of uh, visual artists and other artists. By art, I just don't mean visual art. I mean dance and music and playwriting, you know, uh, dramatists. And I just, I think there's a part of me that always wanted to be a visual artist, but I never got beyond stick people you know, a little, little circle and legs. And that's why I think I'm so amazed with the visual art of like Meredith Riddle or Jim Carcina or Renee Magritte. Uh, so I just am so in love with visual art and all art. So that's a big part of what makes me a poet. And then the family. You, you know, heard about my mom. Uh, more and more, the older I get, that family is creeping in to my poems and also friends that have supported me. The friends in the poetry community here, they define who I am, uh, how I've evolved, their support, their, um, their constant um, encouragement. And that is very important. You, you can't do it alone. You, you have to write alone, you know, in wherever you write. But uh, when it comes to the, the, uh, the work of maturing as a poet and becoming a poet and, and feeling good about your work and yourself, it really does take a village. And I've just been very blessed with the friends in my life, my Therese Becker. And uh, friends in Detroit, friends in Chicago, friends in Grand Rapids. So that's important to me. that I'm honest, that I have no artifice, that I try to tell it as truthfully as I can, and that they come away with um, an appreciation of my journey, my appreciation of where I've come from, that little girl in Slavic village <laughs> with her in, in the backyard with the Hungarian immigrants and the factory in the background to where uh, I am today and because um, that journey is important. And even though you may think that 
you know, oh boy, you know, things are really rough or I'm having a bad day. That process of the journey is such a remarkable revelation. And that's what I find in my work. And that's what I hope a reader uh, can find reading my work or an audience member. Just that journey of getting from, um, from a life to uh, a, a life that looks at poetry in a very important way because uh, uh, for me it is important in, in my life journey. I have a new book coming out next year called Bone Country, and it is a collection of prose poems, and they're from everywhere in the world, but not America. The voice is a, a, definitely an American voice, a Midwest voice, but these are poems that uh, are set in Istanbul, and Krakow, and Warsaw, and Barcelona, and Ireland, and Greece, Santorini, and it is, there are small prose poems, like just half a page, and I consider them postcards from the world before pandemic. Because we used to travel a lot, and I don't know if we will ever do that again, or if, we'll, it will, if the world will ever be the same. If it's not a pandemic, it's war. Um, I've been to Poland nine times, I don't know when I could go there again because they are near the firestorm of Putin's war. And um, all, I have so many relatives and friends that are helping the Ukrainian refugees. A friend of mine asked recently if I, I'm, I'm really dying to go there to help because I know what they're doing. And my friend said, are you thinking of going back? And I said, you know, I am. I am. Whether that is going to be a possibility, a reality, I don't know. But uh, we used to travel so much, and this bone country is like, as I mentioned, postcards from that world before COVID hit. And um, so that's one thing that, that, that I, I worked on, and that's coming out. And then I just finished a draft. I can't say too much about it, but I finished a draft of another book with two other collaborators, a writer and a visual artist. So, but that's in the very early stages. That's why I can't even mention the title. And we're working on that. And if it all goes well, that will be out in early 2024. So that's the, that's the new work. And of course, there's always stuff that's happening that I, uh, I try to do, so. I can see it as a large tent with a lot of different people and a lot of different voices and a lot of different styles and ways of writing and, and speaking and creating our poems. And that's what I like. I love that. I love the vibrancy of spoken word. I love the vibrancy of um, slam poetry. I, I admire the... Um, uh, I admire the craft of the formalist poets. And for me, um, I look at myself as not an academic so much as a poet based in community. A poet based in community, trying to reflect you know, what that community is. And also trying to be uh, truthful to my own voice as the granddaughter of Polish immigrants and all that history that I've talked about you know, with you. But I see uh, the, the future of poetry as uh, this open door where so many different kinds of poetry can be created and celebrated. That's, that's what I would like to see. I'm going to share a poem from the new uh, book coming out next year, Bone Country, and uh, it's coming out from a university press in Wisconsin called Cornerstone Press. It's not related to Cornerstone University here, but it's Cornerstone Press out of uh, University of Wisconsin Stevens Point campus. So uh, this is a poem about Ukraine written before this uh, horrific war that's happening now. And it's a time when things were normal. 
And when I read it now, the residence, the resonance, the how it uh, has this resonance to it, and how it reflects what's going on now, it, it kind of uh, catches my breath a bit. So, uh, excuse me if I, you know, um, have some, uh, you know, hesitancy here. But this is called painted toenails in Ukraine. The young girl who gives the American woman a pedicure in the town's most elite spa doesn't know the difference between a foot or a knee. The woman doesn't want to embarrass the girl and her lack of English vocabulary, so she never corrects her. Other knee, other knee, other knee is the mantra the woman sporadically hears as the right foot and then the left is covered with green kelp from the Black Sea and massaged into her skin's oblivion. Other than the incorrect word, the girl is silent. A thin gold orthodox cross dangles from her neck as she daydreams about her lover's thigh. She paints the woman's toenails in such a hard, brilliant red that weeks later, no nail polish solvent can remove it. The woman will have to wait a year after the nails have totally grown out before every trace of the color is gone. The girl and her halting mantra, a silent echo. So, a poem written before this awful time of war. A poem written when normal things like going to a spa for a pedicure was an everyday occurrence. Well, I talked about family and uh, how important family is to me. And I, ha I can't go without saying how important my husband is for me, not only for my life, but as my life as a poet. He has been so supportive and nurturing and there for me, whether we're in Poland for a month when I'm teaching at the University of Bielska Biała, or we're at AWP in LA or uh, Chicago, or even being my driver today when he you know, dropped me off. Um, his love, and I mentioned this in the Blue Divide in the acknowledgments, his love is in every word on every page. And I know I, you know, he's just a joy. And to have that support in my life on this journey, this journey of poetry is, is really essential. And I'm so blessed and lucky to have that. And uh, I mentioned how family is a, a big thing for me in my work. And uh, that says it all when I talk about him. So uh, insofar as uh, uh, last words for poetry in Grand Rapids, um, I am very fortunate to have been in this city to be the inaugural Poet Laureate. It was such an honor to, uh, to have that position. And even before uh, Mayor Hartwell retired, when he would give his State of the City addresses uh, to 800 people at DeVos Hall, uh, DeVos you know, place, he would have me start the event with reading that poem, The Movement of Grace, that I wrote for his inauguration. Even before his speech or anything else, I'd have a free lunch because it was a luncheon. And um, it was always a privilege to read poetry in a public place like that because it meant it was elevated uh, it was, you know, from the community. It had uh, its base in the community, and yet it was celebrated, you know, in, in such a public way. And that's what um, uh, I want to say about poetry in Grand Rapids, just the celebration, the elevation, and I was just so honored to be part of that process, you know, in, in the history of Grand Rapids poetry. A privilege. My favorite poem in Talking Diamonds, oh, you know, uh, from New Issues Press, 2009, um, a finalist for the Forward Magazine's Book of the Year in Poetry in 2009. Um, uh, it's a poem called Vision 
about the Our Lady of Guadalupe tattoo. Did you get to that one? My favorite poem in this book, and it was given to me. I mean, I saw it on a beach. It was given to me. And uh, we were in Honolulu. I talked about my good friend, Faye Kiknaswe at Wayne State University. Remember, I snuck into her class for free for two years, and she now lives in Honolulu. And the first time, the second time we went to visit her, we had our children with us. Brian and Ellen were with us. And we were on Waikiki. And my son and husband went to learn, they, they took a class in um, how to ride a surfboard. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. They, they wanted to do how to, how to ride a surfboard. So uh, Brian and Tony went out to the waves and they were you know in the class and I stayed on the beach with our daughter, Ellen, and Ellen was doing her, uh, she was playing in the sand. And I think at the time, I'm trying to think, she was how old, seven or eight, our son was like 12. And I was just, you know, on the beach, just people watching, which I love to do. And I saw this man come out of the ocean, like Botticelli's Venus. I think I might have even mentioned that in the poem. And he's got this huge tattoo of Our Lady of Guadalupe on his chest. It was magnificent and it was perfect. It was just like the icon. It was just absolutely great. But what was even better, he imagined like the back of her was on his back. Now, now you don't see the icon of Guadalupe, the back of it, but the tattoo artist imagined what the back would be. That was perfect. It was just magnificent. And when I saw that, I knew I would have to write a poem. So it took me a while. Like I said, I don't have a disciplined, you know, schedule where I have to write every day. It, it took a while. It took a, a few months for that to percolate. But, um... I just love that poem. That is just uh, rich. And uh, I'm so glad you brought up the book. And I'm so glad you brought up the poem because it is, uh, it's one of my favorites. It was a gift. When something like that happens to you, you know that a poem is going to happen. Maybe it won't be today or tomorrow, but a poem is going to happen. So yeah, I would love to read this poem. All right, here you go. And um, towards the end of the poem, there was a litany. Uh, mirror of justice, seat of wisdom, vessel of honor, mystical rose. Maybe not even a lot of Catholics know what that is, but nowadays. Back in the day when I was a young girl going to Catholic grade school in Cleveland, there were litanies. They had a litany to the saints, litany to, uh, uh, you know, the, the sacred heart of Jesus, litany to Mary, and that is part of the litany to Mary. You know, mirror of justice, uh, Tower of Ivory, House of Gold, Gate of Heaven, Star of the Ocean. That was all uh, descriptions of her, of Mary, Jesus' mom. And so, of course, Our Lady of Guadalupe is all about Mary. So uh, this is called Vision. This is the part of your life you're not prepared for. A tropical beach, diamond head in the distance, as predictable as a cliche, a postcard back home on your refrigerator in Detroit. Your husband and son are out there somewhere, splashing in the Pacific, the salt water blowing up their bodies like holy levitation. But you, afraid of water, an anomaly in this place, this chain of islands surrounded by nothing but your pale skin on this tan beach screams out howly, Hawaiian for ghost, walking dead, body without breath. So nothing prepares you for this vision. Our Lady of Guadalupe and Waikiki. A blue ocean away from where she first appeared to that dirt poor Indian peasant on Tepeyac Hill. You can't miss her shape of glorious color coming towards you. Deep teal, bright vermilion, bronzed gold tattooed on the chest of a huge Mexican from Baja. Even his back is emblazoned with her back, and you're stunned by the accuracy of detail. The little angel at her feet, holding a sliver of the crescent moon, as if she were a living, breathing icon. No, no, a holy card, like the one you always wanted in fourth grade, and not just any holy card of any common saint, Agnes with her lamb, Jerome with his lion, Lucy with her eyes on a plate, Thomas with his doubt, but the mother of God in all her human manifestations. 
mirror of justice, seat of wisdom, vessel of honor, mystical rose, tower of David, tower of ivory, house of gold, gate of heaven, star of the ocean. This ocean, this beach at your feet, as if she were Botticelli's Venus, washed ashore with the sea foam, washed ashore for your approval, and you tell yourself, this isn't a miracle, only a tattoo. This isn't anything extraordinary, only your life. The crowded beach, the husband and son, waving impatiently for you to just, come on, come on, dive in. Thank you so much for mentioning Talking Diamonds. And I'm so glad you read that poem. And uh, those lines, this isn't anything extraordinary. Only your life is so ironic because life is extraordinary. That's the whole, you know, that's the irony in that line is like, man, I'm here, Hawaii, there is this tattoo, there's this icon of Guadalupe, who's my, my favorite manifestation of Mary. It's like, this is too good to be true. You know, no, it is something extraordinary and all life is extraordinary. And here's the thing about poetry. As I tell my students, even little kids, anything can be poetry, anything. A tattoo on a beach, you know, a, 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 a banana that's, that's too ripe in your fruit bowl. Anything has that potential to be poetry. It's what you do with it. It's how you transform it by your language, by your vision, by your voice to make it to make it unique in the world. So anything can be poetry, not everything is, it's what you do with, with what you're given. And that was a gift to me. That tattoo was an extraordinary moment, extraordinary. And I didn't even take a photo. It was like, you know, it was beyond the beyond. Why ruin it? I didn't even grab a camera. I just wanted the moment. I just wanted to just, not even a camera between me and the tattoo, just to sink, you know, have it sink in. But um, that, that was an incredible, incredible uh, opportunity. So um, not beyond opportunity, like I said, an incredible gift. And here you have the little gold sticker here, like Michigan Mermaid. Um, it was uh, a Michigan notable book in 2019. It was published by Wayne State University Press in 2018. And it is a story all in poems. So it's a narrative, it's a story all in poems. And there are two writers, two voices, Anne Omen, it, it was my collaborator. And so it's uh, Linda Nemec Foster, Anne Omen, and the uh, fully illustrated by Meredith Riddle. She is our, our artist. And this is how this story began. Anne-Marie and I, I've known Anne-Marie for a long, long time. Um, I've met her before, and we did, uh, we've done readings panels before. And in, I think it was 2007, we were on a panel discussion together uh, in Saugatuck, Michigan. And we were both in an anthology of essays. It wasn't poetry, an anthology called Fresh Water, Women Writing on the Great Lakes. And so we were, there were, I think there was 20 women in this anthology, 20 essays. And um, there were like eight women from that anthology that could come to this reading, this like book celebration. And it was edited by, Freshwater was edited by Allison Swan, and it was published by Wayne State, or excuse me, Michigan State University Press uh, back in, I think, you know, 07. So here we are, and we're sitting um, at, the, at the table, and we're getting ready to talk about, you know, our little essays. And I wrote, uh, actually, it was a long prose poem on Lake Erie. So that was my uh, contribution. Everyone was, a lot of them were writing about Lake Michigan, but I had uh, a piece on Lake Erie. And Allison Swan, the editor, loved it because not too many people were taking other Great Lakes. So anyway, she got Lake Erie in. And um, so we're sitting there, and there's someone, and they're all women, you know, in this book, all women on the uh, panel, there's someone in the back of the room that says, wait a minute, with all these women up here, there should be a Lake Michigan mermaid. Has anyone ever thought of writing about a Lake Michigan mermaid? Well, I was sitting next to Anne Marie. So she looks at me, I look at her, we laugh a bit. 
That night, Anne Marie lives near Traverse City, so she had the long drive back home. That night, she had a new cell phone, and it was like hot in her hands. She had my phone number. She calls me. This is like 1030 at night, but I'm a night owl. I pick up, up, I pick up the phone, and she said, Linda, remember that guy? You know, we didn't even know who it was, that guy in the back of the room that said there should be a Lake Michigan mermaid. I'm thinking, Linda, I'm thinking of doing a project with you. I'm not exactly sure how this would work, but I think it could be a story. I don't know if it would be poems or short prose, but in two voices, you and me writing back and forth, like call and response. And I said, and she said, I could see and envision a young girl living on the shores of Lake Michigan, and maybe there's something out there in the water that wants to befriend her. And I said, I want to be the mermaid. If this is where it's going, I want to be the mermaid. So that's how we came up with the idea. And for almost 10 years, we wrote this in silence, we in private. We didn't tell anyone but our husbands. No one knew about this project. And we, we wrote on and off for about, I'd say more closer to eight years. And then two years later, after we were done, it was, it was accepted for publication. But we had this great vibe going on. She would write a poem, send it to me, all email, all through email. I would respond. Sometimes she would write two, I would respond with two. Sometimes three, I would respond with three. We went back and forth and back and forth, and we developed this story. It's a young girl, she comes from a broken home, Father is gone, not dead, but gone. She lives with her mother and her grandmother in this very modest ramshackle shack on Lake Michigan. We don't know where, but it's on Lake Michigan. And um, she's a loner, doesn't have a lot of friends. She's an only child. She's maybe around 12, and she's going through a rough time. Her grandmother is developing Alzheimer's and the mother wants to sell the home. They need the money. Her, her daughter loves this little home on, on, the Lake, on Lake Michigan. Uh, the grandmother may, be have, may have to be put into a home. The girl doesn't want that. So she's in distress. So she just feels there's something in the lake that wants to befriend her. And there's the Lake Michigan mermaid that feels the same way. She feels a tug at her heartstrings that this girl needs a companion, needs a companion for her journey. So they begin this friendship. And sure enough, towards the end of the book, spoiler alert, she, the mermaid does um, show herself, reveal herself to the girl. And there is a time when the girl want, doesn't want to live anymore. And she goes out in the little paddleboard, paddleboard on the lake to you know go into the water and the mermaid brings her up and says, no, you don't belong in my world. You belong in your world. So she gives her a purpose to go back. And even though the, the grandmother does, they do move her into her home, uh, the, the girl develops a very strong bond with the grandmother because the grandmother saw the same mermaid when she was a little girl. It skipped the mother went from the grandmother, skipped the mother, who is very pragmatic and very hard-nosed, but now it's come back to befriend the girl. So it's a generational story. And then when we got, when it was accepted by Wayne State, we were very happy, but Wayne State gave us, uh, uh, you know, a guideline, we must have it fully illustrated or we can't publish it. This needs, and I, I know what they're talking about. It really just lives with, with being fully illustrated. Every, I'll just, you know, show um, the, because this is not on the screen or not in the digital uh, photos that I gave you, but here's, here's an image, if you could see this, the, the mermaid. And so, uh, but this again is not a digital, but this is, you know, just for your camera to see. So we knew that it needed an illustrator, but who? And so we went through three or four illustrators that didn't work. What they were giving us was Disney's Little Mermaid with the red hair, even with the red hair, and that was not gonna work. Because this isn't a this isn't one of those fairy tales. There's not a happy ending. It's there's a resolution at the end. But it's not a happy fairy tale ending. So at any rate, we finally found Meredith Riddle, 
uh, who lives in Saugatuck. She teaches, uh, she's a fabulous artist, represented by La Fonsi Gallery here in Grand Rapids. And she had never done illustration before because her stuff is very abstract. But she had never done illustration before. And she took this on. Uh, she worked on all the art for about a year. And then we found out Remember there was that voice in the back of the room in Saugatuck when we did the freshwater uh, panel discussion and some guy said, we're thinking some, you know, snarky guy in the back, why isn't there a Lake Michigan mermaid? There should be a Lake Michigan mermaid. But he started us on the journey of thinking about the project. That is, that was Jack Riddle, Meredith Riddle's father. Now, if that isn't karma, if that isn't, this is the way it's meant to be. And because Meredith Riddle was not, you know, the, the first choice of all the artists coming up, because we knew she really didn't do, she did abstract, she didn't do illustrate, you know, uh, uh, illustrations and or uh, uh, illustrated work. But it was um, quite a, a revelation when we found out that it was her father who said that. All I can say is that we are hoping to continue that journey with Great Lakes and, and other lakes and other mermaids, but that's all I'll say at this point, at this time. One, I knew it would be hard, and I, I do things the hard way in, in my life. Uh, I knew it would be hard, but I knew I would have to approach this voice in a totally different way. Uh, the little girl, is her name is Lycretia. She's very down to earth. She's got a narrative voice. And, and Anne Marie is known more for her essays and prose, not necessarily her poetry. So she really gravitated to that voice. And the mermaid is kind of um, lyrical kind of dreamy, kind of otherworldly, and I wanted a crack on it. I wanted a crack on it, and our, I knew um, it would be challenging, and I would have to come up with a new name, because it couldn't be Ariel. I had to come up with um, a new name for this mermaid that you would never see, and like not Tiffany or Rhonda or, you know, uh, Kathy, and her name is Philia de la Cia. Philia Delicia is the name of the mermaid, and it's from the Latin daughter of the lake. It, 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 it's like a, a, a coming together of that Latin phrase, daughter of the lake. And I just wanted to um, have at it. You know, I, like I said, I wanted to crack at it. And um, I love the mermaid's name. I know, Philia Delicia. It's just like it rolls out of your mouth. And, and why that word? It's 14 letters and each of the mermaid poems i can't speak for the girl poems but each of the mermaid poems in this book 14 lines they're not sonnets by any means but they're 14 line poems because she's a mermaid she's not wordy she's not wordy right so i set a parameter for the mermaid poems and uh so when i got to talking about her name um it's the 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 poem that mentions her name in the book philia delicia is uh, an acrostic. So I used the, you know, P-H-Y-L-I-A-D-E-L-L-A-C-I-A. -L -L -A you know, that's the name, that's the spelling of Philadelphia, Philadelphia. And so like George Hartwell's acrostic poem for his, his inauguration, I wrote the name of the mermaid down the page and each line began with P. Perhaps you H heard my name in Why Your Dream Last Night. So it goes on. So it had to be 14 lines. So the poem of the, the name of the mermaid had to be 14 letters. So that's how that came to be. But look at this. Isn't this magnificent? Another uh, illustration by Meredith Riddle. So um, that, thank you for asking about that, because that was a journey. That took faith, because there were times like, is this ever going to be done? Will it happen? Who can we submit it to? Because as every poet knows, uh, it's hard. The, the competition is intense when you submit things for publication. And Annie Martin at Wayne State University Press, she took one look at that draft and said, it's in. We'll get it. We'll get it. We just had to find the illustrator after that, but she'll say, she said, we'll make it happen.
Uh, one other book I'd like to talk about is uh, Amber Necklace from Gdansk because um, it's, it's inspired by my family, all from Poland, and it's also inspired by the first time I went to Poland in 1996. I think I told you I've been there um, nine times, but the first time in 96 was, was quite an amazing experience. And my husband came with me and our daughter, Ellen, who was like 12 at the time. And I had met these relatives for the first time I had only heard about. Some of them I had been writing for for many, many years since I was in high school. And I met them for the first time. And, uh, oh, what, it was a touchstone, not only for my work, but for my life. And so this is, this is a book that's very close to my heart. It really is so close, so close to my heart. Every page is, every page. It's the very last poem. Okay. And it's dedicated to my sister. And when I talk about, there's a, uh, I talk about Aretha, we know who that is, Aretha Franklin. I talk about a smoky bar in Detroit. Actually, this was a smoky bar in Grand Rapids, but I thought that smoky bar in Detroit would have more of an oomph. And I talk about the beer barrel polka, which all you have to know is it's a very fast polka, sort of like a dervish like a, being a whirling dervish. And my Uncle Johnny, uh, no, I talk about, excuse me, not the beer, I, I talk about the beer barrel polka, but I talk about the Chicago hop. That's the dance that's like a very fast polka. So I talk about the beer barrel polka, but the Chicago hop, it's just a very, very fast polka. So when I talk about that in Uncle Johnny, he's the only one who could dance it. So anyway, this is called Dancing with My Sister for Deborah. We're not talking those crazy Polish weddings in Cleveland where we both learned how to dance, clutching each other's sweaty hands, galloping to the beer barrel polka and trying not to bump into Uncle Johnny and his whirling Chicago hop. This is now, tonight, in a smoky bar in Detroit where two women dancing together can, can scandalize any pimp within range where the hotshot bartender can mix anything and has the wide eyes to prove it. Bloody Mary, wall banger, a zombie with a spike of lime that will raise the dead. Above the crowded dance floor in the maze of catwalks, the geek of a lighting man who reminds us of every boy in high school who fast danced with his hands behind his back, shines the spotlight right on us and we glow. Girl, do we glow, not for the memory of those distant high school boys whose faces we can't remember, not for the fluid desire ebbing around us on the floor and beyond where silent men sit in the dark. We glow for the raw truth of Aretha's voice spelling out respect, for the way our hair curls down past our shoulders, for our legs that can outdance any young thing, for the miracle that we survived our childhoods, mother's obsessive cleaning, father's factory shifts, the Irwin Street mob of prejuvenile delinquents. We glow because we came from the same burnt out dream of second generation immigrants and learned to smile at the closed mouth of loss and dance Dance, dance. Bone Country is coming out in 2023. And that's got an interesting story. I told you it's prose poems, all written when we would be uh, traveling. And I just finished it. Um, I had 150 rough drafts. And I went through the process. I had only done after, I started this in 2000. And by 2016, I only had 20 done. I, had, I was doing other things, like Michigan Mermaid, I was doing other things, but I thought to myself, I need that process of discipline and focus. So I asked Kathleen Maguki, a phenomenal uh, master of, of, of prose poetry, I asked her to be my mentor. So for two and a half years, we met twice a month for maybe two, three hours at a time, and I would bring these rough drafts to the table, and I would work on them. And so out of 160 rough drafts, I was able to format 90 wonderful, done 
you know, drafted, revised prose poems. And so we got that done. I got that done. And then we worked on sequencing them. And that was another five, six months of working on that. And right before I went back to Poland to teach in October of 2019, I finished it. And that was my goal. I said, okay, I'm going to finish these 90 to get it all done so that I can breathe easy and go to Poland and teach. So I uh, did that. Uh, and in 2020, I just did some little revising, some tweaking, more revision. And then in the summer of last year, summer of 2021, I started sending it out for publication. And it was a finalist, semi-finalist in two major uh, contests. Um, and it was a finalist in Off the Grid Poetry Prize. It was out of 450 submissions, it was one of the top three finalists. And I got this magnificent rejection letter. It's a rejection letter, but it was magnificent from the editor, Elizabeth Murphy of Off the Grid Press saying, this is such a fine book, such a fine collection of prose poems that I know sooner or later it's going to be accepted for publication. Lo and behold, the next month it was. So I got the contract in January late January of this year, and it's coming out by Cornerstone Press, uh, University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. I'm very, very excited. It'll uh, come out next year, and uh, that was the process of how it went from all these rough drafts for 20 years and finally just looking at these gems and saying, this is pretty good. Let's let's clean them off. Let's polish and polish, you know, polish them up. Let's, you know, do something with uh, this body of work. And who knows, maybe the remaining 60 will find a home too. But right now, I'm just so grateful for Kathleen Maguki and for keeping me on task, you know, uh, keeping me focused and getting, uh, you know, helping me getting the, to get the job done. I just want to continue what I'm doing. Uh, I know there are some poets, uh, after a certain time, they do retire, if, if that's the word, or, or stop writing or stop doing what they're doing. And, I, and you could talk to my husband about this and my children. I don't see that happening. As a matter of fact, I've been more busy now in the last two or three years than I have in my life, in, in my career. For instance, with the Lake Michigan Mermaid, in two years we did 50, 5 zero, 50 presentations. And so I'm just continuing what I'm doing. I'm grateful uh, to be able to do what I do. And uh, so my, the way I envision my future is just to continue the path I'm on and to do more collaborations. I'm very excited about that. More, uh, more things around the corner, and uh, hopefully more travels, because I love to travel, as you can see with Painted Toenails in Ukraine and with Bone Country coming up, uh, that feeds my soul and my spirit to be in, totally, in a totally different foreign landscape and, and how we are still all connected. We're all connected. And there's nothing like travel that really gives you that gift of interconnectedness with our, with our human brothers and sisters throughout the world. So that's what I see myself doing. More writing, more traveling, yeah. more living.